This is episode number eleven with Ben Whitehair. Coming up, I look. I hate sheep. They're so dumb. Horses are amazing. I love horses. They're brilliant, majestic animals. Sheep are morons. There's less faith required now because I I know I'm like yeah I've I've lived it. I knew there were times when I wasn't sure it was going to work out, and I kept working, putting a lot of effort in. And it did work out, so I know that that's possible. I knew nothing when I moved out to LA about being a professional actor. Like I'm almost embarrassed at how little I knew. Now it's worked out really well because that also meant that I had no expectations. There is a wealth of information here, and it was the first time where I felt like I actually knew what was going on in the entertainment industry. I'm like, oh. Hey there! Thank you so much for checking out this podcast. Are you a subscriber yet? If not, click that subscribe button so that you do not miss anything ahead. And if you have an extra moment, go ahead and rate and review the show in iTunes or wherever you find podcasts. That will help others find out about the show. I appreciate all your comments and thank you so much for doing that. Hello and welcome to the Working Actor's Journey. My name is Nathan Agin, and this podcast is in-depth interviews with working actors, people who have been doing this and getting paid for it professionally for thirty, forty, fifty plus years. It is about finding out what took them from A to B. How did they get started? How do they actually work on material? What challenged them? What did they face early on in their career? What do they still get challenged by? And what have they learned from a lifetime of acting? That's what the goal and the purpose of this show is. And so I'm glad you are here. Now, a quick word about me, your host. Again, my name is Nathan Agin. I'm an actor. I studied theater at the University of Southern California. Done a lot of theater, a little bit of TV and film. I'm also an entrepreneur. Work for myself online. I'm a bit of a goofball, which maybe you'll hear on this show. And I'm also a bit of a Shakespeare nerd. Love studying it, reading it, performing it whenever I get the opportunity. Just so you know, there's going to be about ten episodes for the first season of this podcast. As a listener of the Working Actors Journey podcast, Audible is offering you a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to check them out. You can get a book that's an hour long or 15 hours long. Doesn't matter. Whatever you pick, it's free. To download your free audiobook today, go to workingactorsjourney.com/audible. I do have a recommendation with a fantastic narrator. If you want to hear an actor who is exceptional at this stuff, check this book out: "Patient Zero" by Jonathan Mayberry, read by Ray Porter. Ray is one of the greats, and he's been named Audible's Narrator of the Year. Now, don't get thrown by the cover. It's not a typical zombie book, which is not my kind of genre. It was the reviews that sold me. I mean, people really enjoyed the story, but thought that Ray was the true hero of this one. I mean, they loved him so much. Some people wished they could give him more than five stars. And when I started listening to this book, I honestly had to remind myself several times that it's just him reading the books and not a dozen different actors. He's that good, and I've been lucky enough to work with Ray on stage, and I know what a great talent he is. So here's actually a clip from Patient Zero, read by Ray Porter. Chapter One. When you have to kill the same terrorist twice in one week, then there's either something wrong with your skills, or something wrong with your world. And there's nothing wrong with my skills. They came for me at the beach, nice and slick, two in front, one big cover man behind in a three-point close, while I was reaching for my car door. Nothing flashy, just three big guys in off-the-rack gray. All of them sweating in the Ocean City heat. The point man held up his hands in a no problem gesture. It was a hot Saturday morning, and I was in swim trunks and a Hawaiian shirt with mermaids on it over a Tom Petty T-shirt, flip flops, and wayfarers. My piece was in a locked toolbox in the trunk with a trigger guard clamped on it. So you can choose this book, which clocks in at fourteen plus hours, and for me, flew by. 
or choose any of the endless options that Audible offers. Could be a book, a newspaper, a magazine, or even a class. It is that easy. To download your free audiobook today, go to workingactorsjourney.com slash audible. Again, that's workingactorsjourney.com slash audible for your free audiobook and 30-day trial. Today on the show is Ben Whitehair, and he's a bit of a different guest from what you've come to expect here. Ben is a younger actor that I've known for about 10 years, and he's been pursuing acting professionally for about that much time in Los Angeles. And there are two reasons Ben is joining us today. One is that when I was developing this show, I interviewed Ben as a way to figure out what exactly I was doing, what equipment I needed to test drive my interviewing skills, get some of the nerves out of the way, and generally figure out what's working and what isn't. Ben was a great sport with this, and I think that even though it's the first interview I did, it's still a fantastic and very open chat. The second reason I'm excited Ben's here is that I fully believe that he has the potential to be just like all the other working actors I've talked to. He's dedicated, he works super hard, he's passionate about this, and he has a great mindset. So there's no reason he couldn't be an actor that has worked for 30, 40, 50 plus years. Ben and I first connected through the Actors Network in Los Angeles, where I pretty immediately recognized that this guy was smart and very sharp, and you could tell he was different about how he approached the acting career. And we've remained friends over the years, and I'm thrilled that he could join us today. Now, he's already racked up over 50 credits on IMDb, including opposite Matthew McConaughey in the film Gold, and appearances on the television shows Better Call Saul, Grimm, and Nashville. Ben started in Colorado. He was valedictorian of his high school and graduated summa cum laude from University of Colorado at Boulder with degrees in theater, political science, and leadership. He co-founded the company Tuition Specialists, which saved college students about $30 million. He also co-founded the LA Actors Tweetup, a networking event for actors and industry professionals in Los Angeles. He was one of the main contributors to the very successful blog, Play Bills vs. Paying Bills, and he has co-taught a graduate class at UCLA on social media and the business of acting. Ben is also a certified business and mindset coach, and he's on the Los Angeles local board of SAG-AFTRA and the chair of its Next Gen Performers Committee. So yes, just a bit of an overachiever. But you will hear what he's gone through to get to this point, and that everyone has their share of struggles and challenges. So in today's episode, we talk about being a homeschooled cowboy, dealing with abusive relationships, how he developed confidence in himself, putting himself through what he calls grad school for the working actor, his reluctance to join social media and ultimately how he leverages it for his career, why many actors aren't in touch with reality for their career expectations, what you would actually make as a guest star on network TV, his work with the next generation of performers in SAG-AFTRA, and a whole lot more. I'm sure you can tell exactly why Ben is a great addition to the show. So here we go with episode number 11. Please enjoy my chat with Ben Whitehair. All systems go. (laughs) I'm actually nervous. Uh, You know, but I mean, it's a good nervous. You know, it tells you you're uh you're doing something that is important to you yeah but uh i I was talking to you know someone who i'm gonna have on the show this morning you know just he wanted to kind of go over some things and i was like i was nervous calling and just like breathing like okay it'll be all right and then we get on the call and and i'm enjoying it and i'm like okay this is gonna be great he's gonna be you know we could fill up four hours of material 
uh, it'll be super easy. But it's just like, you know, that, that nervousness that is present when you're doing something that is important yeah. and, and something, something that's new and different outside your comfort zone. So, um, so yeah. So even though, you know, I'm talking to, you know, my friend Ben, it's like, <sighs> you know, there's this, this <laughs> well, panting that's going on. It reminds me of, of stage, not even stage fright, but like that, that opening night excitement when you're performing a, a show where it's like, oh my gosh, I'm about to go on. And I've been rehearsing it for six weeks and I'm down and we've got it, but there's still that. I, I talk about this a lot when I, when I coach people, but they did a, they did a study on people who went on a roller coaster and they, they measured their brain waves and asked them afterwards, what was your experience? How did you feel? And basically half the people said really excited. It was amazing. And half the people said, oh my God, I was so terrified. I was afraid. And when they looked at the brain scans, what they found was it was the exact same brain chemistry. The same thing was happening in everybody's brains, but some people interpreted what was happening in their brains and their bodies as excitement, and some people interpreted it as fear. So hmm. fear fear and excitement are basically the same physical things happening in our body. So when I hear, you know, nervous, part of that too is like it's it's excited. Right, exactly. I mean, on that note, like I am, I am excited to talk to you. It's great to, you know, check in with you, you know, whether it's been six months or a year or whatever. I mean, you know, and, and with social media, you know, it's easier to see what people are up to. I will say probably the most entertaining things I've, I've learned about you as I was doing <laughs> oh, no. research oh, was, no. was from your LinkedIn page of all places. Oh, really? Yeah, so I was like, I you know, what I you know, you on there. Well, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna quiz you a little bit, but no, I, I mean, when I go to your website, you know, there's links for Actors Access and IMDb and your yeah. social channels, and, all, and I was like, oh, what's on LinkedIn? And the first thing I noticed was there's a quote uh, up at the top from Marianne Williamson, mm. and uh, yeah. do you do you remember offhand what the quote is? I'm guessing it's from Our Deepest Fear, and and that when we, it's a it's a basically a poem that she wrote that is sometimes misattributed to Nelson Mandela because he used it in a speech once. And, you know, she talks about how our deepest fear is not that we're inadequate. It's that we're powerful beyond measure. And that when we unconsciously let our light shine, we give permission for others to do the same. And yes. for me, that's like my purpose on the planet is to be and create permission for others to be the best version of themselves. If at the end of my life, people say I, I was a better person and, and, worked towards being a better human because I knew Ben in any particular way, then I will have succeeded. So now where did that start? I mean, did you feel like you didn't have permission for you to be who you were? Um, or was that uh, other people giving that for you? I mean, where did this, where, where did this best drop in? Questions. Uh, it was that it was, I didn't feel, well, interestingly, so the first part of my childhood I had an amazing childhood up until I was about 12. I homeschooled for a number of years, started homeschooling, had my parents are great. We lived in the suburbs and had everything and and then when All it right, so let's actually let's jump in there. So where was this? Where did you start? I was in I was in the suburbs of Denver. I was in basically Littleton, Inglewood, Colorado. And okay. and you know, traditional 2.3 kids and a golden retriever and a and, you know, the, the fence on the cul-de-sac and, and very sort of quintessential American suburban home and, and family life. And what did your parents, uh, what do your parents do? So my dad was an attorney. Uh, mm -hmm. He now says he's a recovering attorney. He's doing other stuff. Uh, and my mom actually has passed away, but she at the, she started off in, she was the editor of a book publishing company. She got her MBA uh, at, at Denver University and then was deputy state treasurer for the state legislature. And then she was the executive director of a thing called the Women's Forum of Colorado. And this is part of the transition. Ultimately, she ended up being a goat farmer, uh, <laughs> which is a bit of a, which is a bit of a jump. Right. So, so up until the goat farming, I mean, it sounded like you had very like get it done parents, like very logical, you know, your dad being an attorney, Correct. your mom being, being a book at, you know, book publishing. Yeah, they're editor, very like type A. My mom was president of of CU Boulder, which is where I went as well. Um, you know, she's the youngest deputy state treasurer in the wow. country. My dad was working in top law firms and almost went on, you know, was going to be a doctor and decided to be a lawyer instead. My, my not so secret goal is to make more money playing a lawyer on television than my dad makes as a lawyer. So I can prove I didn't need to go to law school. So I'm, I'm working on that. 
Uh, but no, yeah, bear, both parents are very, very smart, driven, very socially and politically engaged. You know, I mean, that was something that we grew up with, both in terms of their, like, I remember we were family friends with Diana DeGette, who I went on to intern for in, in Congress, uh, who's a, the congressional rep from Denver and has been for, for many, many, many years. And uh, Diana DeGette, the congresswoman's daughter, was born literally the same day as my sister. And our families had known each other anyway, but then they both, you know, our parents had had a child on the exact same day. And so, you know, I remember when I was a little kid, I was standing on a street corner with a sign that said, if I could vote, I'd vote for DeGette. You know, we were out campaigning even as kids. But all of that to say that, uh, you know, both parents were very engaged in the community and, you know, that, that sort of thing. And then it was a pretty significant transition. My, my parents ended up getting divorced and my mom moved out and in with ultimately who would be her second husband on a, on a ranch. This is when you were 12. You were saying everything was going yeah, well. Like right 12. before I turned 12 is when my parents got divorced. And then, yeah, my mom moved out to the, really to the boonies. I mean, it's really, it's the middle of nowhere. Um, in, in Colorado. And I, we had already been homeschooling, which I, which I loved. Uh, but so then I ended up, I mean, I say I was a homeschooled cowboy. So I was, I was living on a ranch and, and we started to learn. Uh, my mom's second husband was a gifted horseman, like one of the most, he was incredible with animals, not so great with the people, uh, but really, really tremendous with, so with, with animals and so in horses. And so we started to learn how to rope and ride. And I was a bull rider and a team roper. And we'd, st- you know, we were these kids from the suburbs who came in and started like winning all the rodeos. And it was like, what? It's like, you know, but we worked insanely hard. And you mentioned things were going really well up until 12. So what you're describing all sounds great. So what, right. what, well, did, what was the, what so, was the change? So Mike was an abusive alcoholic. And this is the second husband. Yeah. And, and then my mom had slash developed uh, a number of mental illnesses that, ha- uh, you know, I, I think probably borderline personality disorder and, and some others. And, and also I basically was an alcoholic and, um, and so it just became a very unsafe physically and emotionally even more so space to be in. Um, it was just a very, oppressive and and abusive environment. And the truth is like, at heart, I am not a cowboy. That is not the life that I want to be living in. Being out in the middle of nowhere, not around people without access to all the richness of, of resources and things that are available was challenging. So I'm, I'm grateful for the experiences I had and I learned a lot and there's definitely elements of that life that are, that I are still with me to this day. And I booked a commercial riding a mechanical bull once and uh, all of that. So, I mean, that's something I have never done. I've never been on a bull. I've never been to a, a bull riding show. I don't recommend you getting on a bull. I would not. I would not change career paths. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm not uh, seeking career uh, advice here. I'm more curious. <laughs> what You said, you know, you still carry things with you. What is it that you still carry with you from that experience? Because I feel like that's something that – most people don't have you have you, you have that quip on your website that like the first time uh what was it like a sheep a sheep herder or rancher oh yeah so I'm, I'm a champion lead. yeah and i'm a champion sheep showman and a champion dairy cow showman okay i don't know what is it what is a show what, what does that mean? even mean so yeah. depending on where you are for a county fair you know you got the carnival y stuff and whatever but there's also like events going on and if you're mm-hmm. in a place that is at all rural there's animals around, right? There's sheep and cows and stuff around. And, and while the county fair is happening, people are competing with their animals. Um, typically, our, I, would do it, I did it through 4-H. So 4-H is one, one of the largest sort of community organizations in the country, actually. But So you show your animals, and there's different versions of it. Sometimes you're, the competition is about the animal, like how fit and well proportioned is the animal. Oh, okay, basically. so these are like dog shows, like, you know, exactly. people are more familiar with. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So, and there, so there's the one where you're like showing like it's about the dog and how good is the dog, and then the other one's about you. How good are you at showing the dog and showing you know, or showing in my case the sheep or the goat or the dairy cow. Uh, and so I, I, I mean, won is it a like is it like the Vanna White of like sheep and yeah, cow, like but how it's like you pre- really like how weird you... because like and it's very. Different. I'm not trying to downplay it. I'm just really trying. No, to No, 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 not at all. Because <laughs> it's the weirdest thing. Like with a sheep, 
the way that you do it is you hold them by their head, basically, and you train them, which is, I, look, I hate sheep. I, they are so <laughs> dumb. They're so dumb. Horses are amazing. I love horses. They're brilliant, majestic animals. Sheep are morons. And so you spend months, like, dragging them around in the most maddening way until they finally start to, like, follow you and take your lead. But they're so stubborn and they're morons. They're, oh, it's so painful. So, but so with the sheep, you hold one hand under, like if you think about a sheep's head, like you hold one hand under their sort of snout, like, like you would a dog, and then one hand sort of behind their ears. And you basically lead them around and you've trained them to sort of go where you're, you know, it's not like you're dragging them, hopefully. Uh, and so you lead them around and then you teach them to brace up against your leg so that they flex all their muscles so that when the judge feels them, it's like, oh, wow, those are nice lamb chops. <laughs> anyway, so that's like, so you're leading it around. You're like staring at the judge the whole time. Like you're not supposed to look at the sheep and then their feet have to, it's a whole thing. And then like dairy cows, you have a, like a harness on them, but you walk backwards and like there's a particular way you have to coil. But anyway. Okay. So what, so what the hell do you still use from all of that? <laughs> so what I still use from all, one, it's a really fun story and it's memorable, but, but mainly what I, what I really learned was the work ethic there, there, you know, the work ethic of being on a ranch you know, cows and sheep and horses don't take a day off, which means you're doing chores on Christmas. And, you know, Christmas morning, great, you want to go get the stuff that Santa brought you, but you you get to go chip ice out of a, you know, their water thing for an hour with a pickaxe so that they don't die before you go in and get the presents from Santa. Now, as a child, not always a fan of that. That wasn't always the most enjoyable experience, but there was a level of work ethic that that was truly incredible. And and similar with rodeo, part of the reason why we won and we're so good is because we we worked at it. We put in so much effort. You know, I would I would rope a hay bale until I could get it a hundred times in a row. And I would do that every day, you know? So I was just spending hours the same way that an athlete does in any particular sport, right? Where you're out there, if you're a basketball player, you're taking free throws over and over and over and over. And that level of work ethic has translated into business, into my acting career, into, you know, a- any of the other endeavors that I, that I pursue now. And so that intense focus was that something that came from your parents or all of your siblings like that? I mean, because I'm someone that has, you know, I'm all over the place in terms of different projects I'm doing. But, you know, to have that kind of discipline of, you know, just working on this one thing, you know, whether, you know, for right. some people it's an instrument or, you know, a sport, like you know, like you're talking about. But just to have that dedication and discipline to do it day in, day out, um, where where did that come from? Where Like, was there something you were kind of modeling in terms of other people in your life? I think it's actually a really important question because one of the things that I've noticed when I'm working with people or coaching people is that seeing the day in and day out example of someone who is focused and putting a high level of consistent effort into a particular goal, whatever that is, whether it's a career thing or an instrument or a sport, seeing that modeled, I think is so important. And if, and I, I, I find that people who haven't either grown up or seen it modeled in a powerful way often sort of struggle because they just don't even know what it looks like. Like what, okay, people say, yeah, you have to work really hard, but like, what does that mean? And, and so the, the short, to answer your question, yeah, my parents very much modeled that even from the beginning of growing up, you know, uh, my parents were both, they did very well in school and they worked really hard and they, you know, had good jobs and, and they worked very hard at being parents and, you know, they were very active in our sports and they were around and, you know, they, they, they were very intentional people growing up. And then on the ranch, it went to an unhealthy extreme where it, it became abusive. I mean, the num you know, what we were expected to do and how we were treated and other stuff was, was, you know, an abusive environment. So it went to the far end of that spectrum, but, but there was still that high level of discipline and focus on something. And, and yes, both my both my brother and sister who grew up in that environment have a very similar level of focus and dedication applied very differently, but yeah. they're able to really hone in on something and given whatever, you know, if they have if for any of us, if there's something we really, really want, we will do whatever it takes to make that happen. So now 
I started all of this because we were talking about that Marianne Williamson quote, yeah. and I, I, I realized I didn't give you an opportunity to really, you know, answer it fully. But you know, I think we're we're getting closer to this. So, you know, this this idea of you know you being the light, so that you're giving permission for others to be their own light. Yeah. So was was that your parents, and was that you know, or was it a sibling? Was it somebody you know in your community? Where do you feel like that most strongly came in? Was it after you were 12, after your parents divorced or, or you know, because, because obviously if you're feeling like I don't have permission to be me, something is going on externally or internally yep. that's, that's creating that. So where, where did that come into play? So after, you know, four years of living on the ranch in what became an, inc- it didn't start out as particularly abusive, but it, it very much was by the, by the end of that point, which is how the abuse cycle works. By the end of that, I was feeling like this is not the life I want to live. I, I remember <laughs> uh, I, we, we had taken a special trip to the super Walmart, which that in and of itself should tell you something. Cause we once a <laughs> month would go into town and you would we would do all of our shopping and your clothes and your groceries right. and then once a month. Super so this was a special trip. This was in addition to our once a month, voyage to the super Walmart an hour away. So we go on a special trip, which must mean it's a big deal, right? And I'm with my stepdad and we went to get three things. And, and as I saw them going down the conveyor belt, like my life was flashing before my eyes. We had, we had picked up a case of Budweiser beer, a case of shotgun shells, and a case of hemorrhoid cream for the ringworm that the cows had given my brother. And there I was in my Wrangler jeans (laughs) and my Stetson hat. And I was like, looking at the hemorrhoid cream and the shotgun shells. I'm like, what? Like, this is not my life. This is not what I signed up for. I can't keep doing this. Uh, I just thought that moment has always stuck out to me. But so increasingly, I felt as if I was living in a world that was just not, that was, it wasn't what I wanted. And I didn't have access to the kinds of resources that I felt would allow me to live my fullest life. I don't know that I would have articulated it that well at the time, but that's that's what was going on. And I wanted to go to a big public high school. Like I'd been homeschooling and it, and it really was amazing. I'm so glad I did that. But I'd gotten to the point where I wanted access to student groups and to clubs and to calculus teachers and, and all of those things. And the town where we were living in, you know, the high school, I would have been, a, I think, the 16th person in the graduating class. It was a tiny, tiny, tiny school. with very. I played eight-man football my freshman year because there's not enough people in the town to have a full 11 man football team. So I I just wanted a bigger life for myself. And so ultimately, both in terms of what I wanted and in a way my hand being forced in in terms of how my mom was being and what school they were weren't going to let me go to and these other pieces I I made the decision to move out of my mom's house and go move in with my dad back in the in the suburbs. And in a, at the time, it really felt like, I, oh my, I just have to do this. Like, this is my only choice. Like, that, this is, in order for me to have any kind of the life that I want, this is what I have to do. It, it, it wasn't even this, like, huge premeditated thing. It sort of got to a thing where, like, I know I need to go to a big public high school. And if my mom isn't going to sort of let me do that here, I guess I'm going to go move with my dad. And I did and ended up going to Littleton High School, which was incredible. I got an amazing education. Yay for public schools. And I was able to then thrive in a way where like, oh, wow, I actually have permission to be the kind of person that I want. And the, and the high school was amazing. Much credit to our principal, Dr. Westerberg, and, and the leadership of the school because we didn't have any cliques. And it was a very open and, and inclusive environment. And then it's where I found the theater community my, my second semester, sophomore year when I'd started there. And looking back, I think it was the first time in my childhood, or at least, you know, had been for many, many years where I felt like, wow, I can be whomever I want. And anybody around here can. And I think that is so much of what attracted me to, to acting and performance and the arts was this community and this inclusion that was available. So you're, you're telling me you're, you're the guy who actually enjoyed high school. I loved it. I've heard this exists, but for most people, it was like, no, nah, it was really kind of tough. Um, but that is amazing that uh, it was great you, the way you described it. And I had skipped middle school because I'd been homeschooling, and and for me, I I've only met I can count on one hand the people I've met who enjoyed middle school, and having skipped that, what I think is often an oppressive social environment in a lot of ways allowed me to thrive in high school because what I had learned was 
learning is up to me. Everything's a learning experience. Learning is awesome. I can do whatever I want. My parent, both my parents were very good about that all growing up of like, what do you want to learn? That was the context of our homeschooling was, what are you passionate about? We'll go learn it. We'll go facilitate you experiencing it. My brother loved the Civil War. So we read all the books, we watched the movies, and then we went back east. We took a road trip. We went to Gettysburg. We saw the battlefield. We were in it. And so I brought that to high school. And so I was that I was that guy in high school who was always raising my hand and I did every student group and I was involved. And ultimately I, I, you know, I graduated valedictorian and, and I just ate it up because I, I it was such an intentional choice for me to be there. I so had wanted that and and then was in an environment both with you know, my dad who was supportive and the teachers and everyone who really supported me in flourishing. Okay. So we got you in high school and, you know, it's a very supportive environment. And I, and I agree that people, you know, are, and I think you find this once you get out of school and you're in the real world, that you uh, tend to focus more on the things that you care about uh, as sure. opposed to like, I don't, need to know trigonometry day to day. So I'm probably not going to spend hours learning it. Whereas that's what a lot of times public school is directing you towards. Or if you're doing something that does involve trig and you're like, man, I really want to learn everything there is to know about this. Yeah. So yeah, having that like kind of self-directed approach, I think is uh, a really healthy way. And I mean, it, I've met other people that have kind of done that a similar experience where they were homeschooled mm-hmm. up until like eighth grade or ninth grade. And then sure. they want more of that yeah. social interaction because they, they can feel like they're missing something, you know, and they're in the social component is very important, I think, to developing as an adult. So you find the theatrical community, you graduate high school and did you know you were going to go to college in Colorado? Uh, what was the you know, right? How did you how did you choose where you were going to study? Well, let me say one thing before that. I will say homeschooling. In a way, I think I got better social skills because I homeschooled. Because mm-hmm. I find that middle school in America is perhaps the worst place to learn social skills on the planet. Because kids are so mean to each other, and whether you're fat, skinny, tall, short, black, white, if anything. Kids make fun of you and they're mean and people's hormones and like, it's just this crazy environment. And so during those years, I was outside of that and I was interacting with adults and I was like in the real world. We would go to museums and we would travel and I would talk to people and, you know, uh, interview people who are working professionals. And so I'm just very grateful. And I just want to say that caveat because like sometimes homeschooling gets like a bad rap because there are people who homeschool because they say the world is a dangerous place and we're going to keep you from it. And our context was the world's an amazing place to borrow a Mark Twain quote, you know, school's getting in the way of your education. Let's go be in the world. So anyway, uh, I, I, you know, I took that social piece and really brought that to high school. I wanted to be there. I wanted to learn. I discovered acting. It had always been the context that I would end up in college that, you know, both my parents had both had graduate degrees and it, it's not even, we didn't really talk about it. It was just like, yeah, that's just what you do. You finish high school and you go to college and in a way, it was almost assumed that you then go to grad school. And I don't, I don't think that my parents put any particular active pressure on me to do those things. It wasn't like, you have to go to, it was like, oh yeah, it's just what you do. And I wanted to, I wanted to continue learning and all those pieces. And, and so then when I was looking at colleges, I, I really wanted to go live in New York. I really wanted to get out of Colorado. Um, so I, you know, I got into NYU, I got into USC. I, I basically got into all the schools I uh, applied for. Uh, Pomona and Harvey Mudd I looked at uh, uh, and and almost went to USC. I really wanted to go to NYU, but none of those schools gave me any money. And and then fortunately, I, I uh, got into a thing called the President's Leadership Class at, at CU Boulder. And then beyond that, I, I uh, was awarded the Betcher Scholarship, which is a scholarship that they give to the top 50 students in Colorado every year. Um, actually, now I think 52. And so it was a full ride scholarship to any school in Colorado Plus, like they help pay you your expenses and some rent and everything else. So at the time, it felt like a really close decision. Like I didn't make the, uh, the deadline was, you know, 10 a.m. one morning. I'd had, you know, two months and I didn't decide till 8 a.m. that morning because it felt like, I don't know, USC and California and these other programs, you know, what does $150,000 in debt mean anyway? Like, man, eh, whatever. Looking back, oh my God, I'm so glad I made the decision I did. Not the least of which was because I, you know, had extra money when I graduated college as opposed to owing six figures of debt. But ultimately what I found was particularly, I think for undergrad, so much of your education is up to you and what you put into it. And this is life, right? Or what I put into it. 
and I got an amazing education. I, I'm looking at on, on my wall. You guys can't see it, but I'm looking at my wall at, at my diploma from Boulder and the picture of the campus. And, and I have so much gratitude for the experience I had from the theater department from, I ended up to, I studied biochemistry for a while and political science, but ultimately for the things that was outside of the classroom, there were a number of student groups that I started. I'm looking at it on my wall too. I started a thing called the co-created with a, with a group of fellow students and, and good friends, uh, a thing called the Colorado Creed, which to this day is still around and, and in the news and literally in stones around the Boulder campus. If anybody ever goes to uh, CU Boulder campus, first of all, it's beautiful. Just go because it's stunning. Boulder and is a pretty amazing place. Yeah, It's amazing. And when you walk around campus, look, pay attention to the ground and you'll see the, the red brick stones that say act, honor, integrity, accountability. And you'll see the seven words from this Colorado Creed that we created when we were in, in college. And they're literally in stones in the ground all over the Boulder campus. But so having access to Again, Boulder did an amazing job of, of supporting students to say, hey, what do you want to do? We'll help make that happen. You know, Deb Coffin, who is now in Vice President of Student Affairs, was like, okay, you guys want to start this creed? Done. How can we support you? What do you need? How can we help you make it happen? And, and that set me up to win after I graduated in, in ways that are just fantastic. So one of the things I, I got to not necessarily call you on, but this is, I think, this drops into my perception of you a lot you know ben has it so good and he's so lucky and like everything happens <laughs> for him uh-huh you know and i mean even as we talk you know there's the part of my brain going right but he works hard and like you know he had struggles you know with his parents growing up and all that but it's it's easy i think to kind of squash that side of my brain and be like he was doing so well in school and he got to do all these things and he created this program and do it da, 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 da. you know it's like and i think it's what i'm getting at is not necessarily my complaining is <laughs> more where does that confidence come from? Because we all have ideas of things we'd like to do or things that we think might make our lives or the lives of others better. But for you, and I know we're getting a very high level look at this, but like this desire to do these things or study these different things or create this program or join this thing. And, and I know it's continued for you like in, in your businesses and in your career, but where does that confidence come from? Or, or what's the what's the discussion with any fear that might come up? Because I know you're not fearless. It's just absolutely. How do, you, how do you deal with that, knowing that, like, yeah, this, you know, is it just I'm going to do it and you do it, or you know, what's the what's the internal process there? Well, looking back, partly overall, I, I think my childhood and my upbringing really did set me up to win in that way. I had a very stable foundation as a human. And like I said, especially for the first 12 years, like I was very fortunate. I, I had a very lovely, uh, you know, every family has their stuff, but I, as good as, as anyone could hope for. So I had a very f stable foundation. Was it a very like open communication family? Yeah. Oh, look, there, uh, in certain ways, there were things that were very, very secretive that are cycles that I've needed to break as an adult. So there were certain elements that were not, but overall, yes, it was communicative and loving and supportive. Now, the other piece was those years on the ranch in that environment really was, I mean, it was traumatic. Like my mom tried to hire somebody to kill my dad and like my stepdad, you know, I had this incident where he threw me down the stairs and it was like this just this crazy awful environment. And so part of, not even necessarily the confidence, but like my gratitude and like having gone through that, it's like everything else is gravy. <laughs> like it was such a horrible environment for those years that was, I just, I don't want any human to experience. And so then on the other side of that, it's like, even on my worst day, my life is still so good. So it's not like I don't have fear or struggles or down periods, you know, uh, frankly, this year for the first, especially half of the year, but it's just been a harder year with less tangible, immediate successes during a, any particular six month time period, probably since I can remember. So it's not like I don't go through those things. I am very fortunate. One, I'm very much aware of my privilege. Like I grew up in a Again, relatively stable home. I'm 
a straight white cisgendered male who comes from a, you know, middle, upper middle class family. And so there was a level of experiences and opportunities and risks that I could take. You know, it's, it makes you kind of sad, but when they, when they study entrepreneurs, one of the things they find that is the most likely indicator of whether or not someone is a successful entrepreneur is basically how wealthy their family is. Because when you have access to a safety net in your life, you can take risks. You know, I started, a, I co-founded a company during, when I was in college and then I had, you know, money again, I got, I mean, I worked my ass off. I worked harder in high school than I, I would say I probably worked at least as hard as anybody else in my high school. That is why I was valedictorian. I, I am, I am a smart person and my, and both my parents are brilliant. Like I, I got some good genetics, but I also, I worked my ass off and, and it paid off. And so, and I think part of where the confidence comes from is I, I got to see the rewards of a lot of effort and doing my best to be a good person. Ben's formula to success for any human is effort plus being a good person over time. I find that that is what creates success. And, and so I got to see that. Like I saw starting, particularly starting in high school, like I worked so hard. And then I saw like, wow, I worked really hard. And then I like got these awards and I got this scholarship and I got paid to go to college. That's not why I was working hard. That wasn't even on my radar. I just, I wanted to, and I had that work ethic and I wanted to learn. I wanted to do as much as I could. But so then that, but so then I was rewarded, you know, sort of societally rewarded for doing that. And I was like, oh, I'm going to keep doing that. And then I continued to do that in college and it led to, oh, I, you know, these other awards and then I'm attracting and meeting these other people and I'm getting access to things and and now I'm able and I co-founded this company and now we're able to start saving college students money and then ultimately you know was able to take a company from idea to you know 15 or 20 employees at the end but I've been fortunate in that I got to see that reward structure over time mm. wow I keep working really hard and I do things to support other people and, and do whatever I can. And, and that pays off. And so in the down times, particularly now, you know, I can have six months or a year that feels like, man, I am riding the struggle bus right now. I'm not getting the results I want. It's not happening in the time frame that I want. But I have already in my life had examples where that was true and with consistent effort and some some versions of luck and all these other pieces, but over time that it does ultimately then get me to the thing that I want. So it, it does, it makes it easier because I've already had that experience. So there's, there's less faith required now because I, I know I'm like, yeah, I've, I've lived it. I knew there were times when I wasn't sure it was going to work out and I kept working, putting a lot of effort in and it did work out. So I know that that's possible. Yeah. I was actually um, just listening to an interview with Jerry Springer you know, he was talking about how his family, I'm going to forget the particulars, but I think it might have been his family were some Holocaust survivors or something to that effect mm -hmm. where he's just like, I know very directly because of the people in my life what, you know, severe tragedy looks like and what, you know, yeah. what horrible things are. And so whatever happens to me or, you know, most things going on, it's like, yeah, not really a big deal. It's like, you know, these are these are heavy things. So as you were talking about, like, you've had your struggles and, you know, as you've worked hard, you've been able to see the fruits of your labor. And, and it's, it's again, keeping that, keeping those things in perspective of like, yeah, okay, if you don't book the job that you wanted, it's like, okay, well, you know, my life isn't over, you know, like there are other opportunities, there are other yeah. things. It's not that those same feelings don't come up, you know, I mean, just this week, there have been some things that were really stressful and oh, I didn't, uh, I'm not quite getting the particular success in my business that I was going for, you know, these last couple of weeks and other things. And, and I'll get, I can find myself feeling stressed out or overwhelmed or, or these other emotions. And part of the practice is then I come back to, I choose to say, wow, even on my worst day, I'm alive. Spoiler alert, we are all going to die. Hopefully not for a long time, but I endeavor to come back to that as needed to remind myself that even when things are a challenge, even when I'm unhappy, even when things are a struggle or I'm not getting what I want, that's okay. I'm allowed to have those experiences, but to remind myself of that perspective. And that generally puts me back into a place of gratitude. And, and I can even just practice, okay, I'm feeling stressed out and overwhelmed and unhappy or whatever. 
what are the things that I'm grateful for? And the brain isn't capable of experiencing fear and gratitude at the same time. So it's the quickest shortcut to go, even if something's small, you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to be alive. I'm grateful that I have a computer and I live in America and I, and I'm, I'm pursuing a career doing the thing that I love. I mean, I'm in the minority, like how, how lucky am I? So even on my worst day of that, how amazing. Now, sure. I don't yeah, always feel that way. And so I sometimes like, no, I get lost and stressed out and frustrated. And then, then it takes, you know, intentional effort to come back to that. So now I want to talk about, you know, when you made the uh, decision to come to LA to move to Los Angeles, because you were, I mean, how much acting were you doing in Denver before you decided to move out to LA? I moved pretty quickly after I graduated because it was okay. what, what, what it came down to. So I'd been doing a ton of theater, both at Boulder and a little bit in the community. I started to do some short films and stuff and feature films in Denver with, you know, independent filmmakers. And, and so like my, in between my junior and senior year of college, I interned, like I mentioned, uh, for Diana to get the congresswoman from Denver. And I was deciding, do I want to go into politics and go work on the Hill in DC and go live that life? Or do I want to move to LA and be an actor? And one of, one of my best friends from high school, Teju, shared this quote with me. It's a Howard Thurman quote, ask not what the world needs, ask what has you come alive, because what the world needs are people who have come alive. And that really resonated with me because there was the part of me that felt like, ah, uh, I could make more of a difference, maybe going into politics and doing social stuff or starting a nonprofit, or maybe I should do that, right? Should, this very dangerous word that we get trapped in. And ultimately what I was like, well, what I want to do, what makes my heart come alive is acting. So let me at least go check it out. The worst that happens is I do and I decide I don't want to do that. And, and it took me a few years and, and a lot of personal development. But ultimately what I realized was the thing that I'm doing doesn't particularly matter. In, in the context of making a difference on the planet, what I'm doing doesn't really matter. If I'm committed to making a difference, then I will do that no matter what I'm doing. And that, that, that same is true for anybody. If someone is, is spending most of their time being a parent or an accountant or an actor or whatever, that's not the thing that inherently means you're making a difference or not. It's that if you're the kind, if you decide to be the kind of person who's committed to making a difference, then in whatever you're doing, you can make that happen. And it took me a while to realize that. And it, it, it I, di I didn't always feel that way, but that's what I've experienced. Did you ever think, you know, you had, you had talked earlier about um, applying to NYU. Did you ever think about moving to New York and doing, you know, the theater Broadway scene? Or did you know film and TV was the focus? I've always wanted to live in New York. What I realized when I was graduating college, and I started a, a blog because of this with a, with a buddy in New York and one in Chicago talking about the three main acting cities. And like, what does it actually mean to be an actor in these cities? Uh, when I started looking at how much rent would be and what you would get for it in New York, I was like, Oh man, I don't. You had a ranch. You couldn't. You couldn't move into a closet. I, don't, I exactly. I don't think I want to live in a closet that is also my bathroom, that is also my kitchen. I don't. Uh, I don't know. I don't think I want to do that. And I don't sing or dance. Uh, that's not true. I do sing or dance, not at a level of skill that one would pay me to do those things. And so I was like, well, I guess New York is like really music. You know, that's, there's so much musical theater, and that's just not what I would be doing. And I did kind of like the idea of making enough money to, you know, pay bills by acting. And it's just harder to do that in the theater. So, so that was sort of where then I decided to move to LA was, was really based on those, on those decisions. And how long have you been in LA now? It will be nine years on February 9th. Okay. So we first connected through the Actors Network. Yep. Um, and how soon into your time in LA did you join that? Within the first year. I moved okay. in February and I joined the Actors Network, I think, you know, four or five, six months later. And so, you know, did that, did that help kind of shape how you wanted to approach your career? Did you already know, like, okay, this is what I'm going to do? You, you know, I mean, I'm just kind of curious, like, how you decided what you were going to go after uh, as, as an actor, like, as, a, as another white guy who's landed in L.A. who wants to be an actor – there are other white guys in LA who want to be actors. You don't see, I imagine these ah, are what your auditions crap. are filled with. <laughs> um, no, I, I still be I'm like, yeah, I, I heard there was a shortage of actors in LA. So that's why I moved out here. Um, I knew nothing when I moved out to LA about being a professional actor. Like I'm almost embarrassed at how little I knew. Now it's worked out really well because that also meant that I had no expectations. My experience is that most people 
moved to LA with the expectation that, oh yeah, I'll move out within a year, I'll get an agent and I'll book a pilot. And if that doesn't happen, then uh, I guess I wasn't meant to be an actor, which is insane. Right. So now, I mean, I, you know, I went to college for acting too. Do you feel like there are programs out there that are preparing students for the business of acting and what it means to actually work as a professional? Because, you know, you said you felt like woefully underprepared, but I, I mean, maybe it's changing, but uh, it just seems like that seems to be the vast majority of most actors' experiences is they know their craft. They know yep. how to, you know, understand a character, or break down text or beats in yeah. a scene or whatever it is. But the whole other part, especially if you're going to live in a place like L.A. Yep. Uh, or New York or Chicago where you have to be a working professional, it just seems like that's not part of the curriculum, so to speak. And, and hopefully that's changing in programs, but, you know, overall. It is starting to change. You are absolutely right. Overall, and this is true of any creative career, acting, writing, dancing. If you are pursuing a creative career, these things are a business, the average episode of television costs $3 million to make an episode. It is a business. It is a multi-billion dollar business. And I'm not saying it's not an art as well, but if you want to get paid for it, it's a business. And the Actors Network, uh, to your original thing, absolutely shaped so much of that for me to go, oh, yeah, I start to understand the business side of it. And are there programs out there that are teaching it? Sometimes UCLA hired me and my buddy AJ Meyer to, to go teach a class at UCLA about the business of it. So, so, so yes, yeah, so those students who were in that class got a semblance of the business side of it. And, and you know, I spoke to the, the graduating students at Boulder who came out here to LA for a thing. So it's, I think it's starting to change, but overall, no, I don't think it prepares people. So what were some of the things you took away from the network, the Actors Network, that was like, oh, this is what it means. Like if I'm actually going to, you know, have a shot at this and not just be another guy where it's like, yeah, I'm kind of, you know, I might have an audition here or there. I'm hoping to get an agent or like, yeah, I got, I got a few projects going on. Like, you know, it's like, no, I'm actually making progress on my goals. Yep. How did, how did that translate to you? Cause obviously you're a very like driven person. So just give you like some ideas and you can take it. So where, where did you go with that? What, what did you take away from it? Well, cause when I show up to LA, I'm like, okay, well, what do you, what do I do? A lot of the advice out there is about mindset. And, and the longer I've gone on in LA, the more I realize why. Because I'm like, oh, yeah, because if, if you don't have the proper mindset and habits and approach, nothing else will matter over time. But I was like, okay, if you have the proper mindset or at least something close to it, now what? Like it's a Tuesday. What do I do to make my acting career happen? What do I do? I'm in. I'm committed. Let's do it. What actual steps do I take? And the Actors Network gave me that. I, I started to go, oh. I can start forming relations. And this came from both from the Actors Network and Kevin E. West and Paolo Andres. I had taken Bonnie Gillespie's thing. I remember some really amazing conversations I had with, with Brian Vermeer and Christina Hughes, who created Performer Track. You know, all these things, because I was so hungry to learn that in that in the first year or two in LA, I, I say, you know, I, I sort of put myself through grad school of the working actor. I read every single blog. I, I would ask anybody I could find who was, you know, successful in their career as many questions as I could, the Actors Network, Bonnie Gillespie, all these other things where I got to hear, okay, what do you do? Oh, it's really about relationships and people have to know who I am. And what about my marketing materials? Okay. And like headshots and okay, what does that mean to have a, an effective headshot? And what about a demo reel? And what about getting marketing materials out there? And then I started blogging and then I discovered social media. And then that really led to, you know, for me, that was the big way that I've sort of broken into a lot of relationships in the business was through this blog I created and Twitter. And now, I mean, now I teach it and I've been flown around the country to teach social media and, and these other pieces. But that's so much of what the foundation was of someone saying, hey, I've been pursuing this career for 20 years. Here are the things to start paying attention to. Here are things you can do. And it's a business and there's so many different aspects of it, right? There's relationships and marketing and you know, your marketing materials and who you are as an actor and the way you run your business and the financial aspect of it and how do you pay your bills doing it. And the entertainment industry is a vast thing. And there are 20 different industries. I mean, you know, one thing Kevin always talked about was like, look, there are 20 different industries. I think actually there were more that you could do as an actor. There's voiceover and within voiceover, there's commercial voiceover, which is very different than uh, audiobooks, which is very different than animation. There's all kinds of different hosts things. You can do improv, you can do sitcoms, right? And on and on and on. 
And so partly I, the way that I work as a human is I like to go be exposed to everything possible and then narrow from there. You know, I did that in college, both in high school and college. I'm like, okay, let me do everything and then start to narrow it down. I've, I've tasted, I've gotten an, an experience of all these different things. Let me then start to hone in on the things I care most about. And so that's been my experience is I, I've done everything. I did commercials and voiceover and improv and this and that. And, and now I've started to hone it in. So now you mentioned the social media, which I know is a big part, and uh, I'm not that much older than you, but I'm going to sound it in a second when I say, can you explain this social media thing to me? I mean, I know Twitter is your big thing, and maybe it's it's probably more just me than like my age or my generation, but like I get a little overwhelmed with Twitter. I'm just like, wow, there's yeah, so much going it is. on. It's overwhelming. So I'm curious, like, how do you approach, uh, I mean, I guess Twitter specifically, but then social media, and, and how do you use it as an effective tool? Because that's something that I think like people in any city, any, I mean, that is the nice thing about Twitter is like you get at, you can get access to people that are nowhere near you geographically. Yep. Uh, and yeah. you know, what, uh, different socioeconomic strata, you know, all these yeah. different things. It's, it's, it's a level playing field. So yeah. how do you approach it that it doesn't feel just like throwing, you know, darts into the wind and sure. you know, it actually feels effective? Well, I was really hesitant to get on Twitter. I was like, whatever. I don't care what people had for lunch. This is stupid. 140 characters, dumb, dumb, dumb. And, and my friends who were, who were deep in the entrepreneurial business world were like, dude, you have to join Twitter. You must. And so I was like, okay, fine. I'll join. And I did. And then I, and then I started finding that there were all these agents and managers and casting directors and producers on Twitter, people who were at the height of the industry. And I started following them and just started paying attention to what they, I was like, oh my God, there is a wealth of information here. And it was the first time where I felt like I actually knew what was going on in the entertainment industry. I'm like, oh, I actually know what's going on in LA. I actually started to understand, oh, this is the entertainment business. This is how people are thinking. This is what they're talking about. These are the things that matter to an agent. And so I just started listening. And then ultimately I started engaging with people and communicating and having, you know, a dialogue, doing whatever I could to add value, right? And, and I was blogging and shit. And I was, you know, I was finding all of these resources, blog posts and articles and videos and ideas. And I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. I didn't know any of this before I moved to LA. That's insane. People need to know. How, how did I not know this? This must be shared. Even if one person hears it, I want them to know what I wish I would have known when I got here. So I just started sharing and, and ultimately adding value. But I, I was like, oh my God, I have to. I have to put this in a blog post. I have to put it out there. And as I did that, I started to build a community and engage relationships. And the short version is then I, I got agents. I started to meet casting directors. I booked work. Because really, all social media is, is a tool for communicating with other humans. And as artists, I mean, that like that's what art is. That's what acting is, is communicating with other humans and building rapport. Like that's what we trained in. And then social media is just a different tool to do that. So it, it does sound like whether you say adding value or, you, you know, just, you know, saying what you had for lunch, but like putting stuff out there that can feel a little overwhelming for people if they feel like, what would I share? So it sounds like, you know, a good place to start is just listen to the people who are out there and doing the work to see what they are talking yes. about. You can, you can just, you know, have a little Evernote folder or document and just note things and just have it for yourself. That's fine. But if yes. you feel, you know, if you start to feel compelled to engage with somebody, then you can do that. But you can also just use it as a huge research tool of just like, Absolutely. oh, I want to work, you know, I want to work on this ABC show or this Netflix show. So let me follow the creators. Let me follow the exactly. actors. Let me follow the writers and just see what is going on in their lives. Because these that people, exactly it. you know, especially for, you know, someone in Los Angeles, so it's not exclusive. If you're following a show that is shot in your town, these people are among you. You know, you might run into yeah. them at the, at the grocery store, but it's like they're not some far off, distant, mystical land. Like they're. I mean, that's that, that's one of the kind of the funny yeah. things about and moving it's, to it's LA. A person, it, right? Oh, that's a human. <laughs> that's not some. Right. Oh, this mystical, magical person. Exactly. You realize, like, when you move to LA, like, oh, 
the celebrities are among us. Yeah. You know, like there's not like <laughs> the Hollywood. It's coming from inside the house. The ho- the Hollywood Hills aren't where Puff the Magic Dragon lives. Exactly. Like it's 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 an actual place. You can drive around and you can point out where they live. Like they're they're there. And and the same goes with the CEOs and the writers and all that kind of stuff. So so they're out there and and like you said, they're they're humans as well. They're people. They're normal people and they have interests and ideas and they're trying to put out something that they find interesting. Yeah. So, the, so yes, my first rule of social media is to listen. People, people, I think, hear about social media and think of it as a megaphone and a way to like, look at me, check out my stuff, give me things. But if you turn that megaphone around and you, and you use it as an acute listening device, that to me is where it's most powerful and the best place to start. So you've been in LA for nine, you said almost nine years. Yep. When do you feel like you started to get like traction? in your career, you know, in terms of maybe booking projects, like what, when did you, when did you find in the book something where you're like, Oh, this is nice and legit. And like, this is, this seems to be all going in the right way. Like all this, as you were talking about the rewards you were seeing pay off yeah. earlier in your life that you're like, Oh, all this hard work is actually making a difference. At some point within the first, I think about three months into LA, I, you know, I was getting settled and, and I'd started to find, you know, some of these other resources. And then I just started doing what most people do is I started self-submitting on Actors Access and these other sites. And I started submitting. I started, I remember, I remember the first audition I got. I was like, oh my God, like I have an audition in LA for, for like a parody music video. They're doing the audition in a park. It was like the weirdest thing ever. But so I just started auditioning for, for low levels, student films, web series, dinky little shorts people were doing. And by stroke of luck and other things with a crappy headshot, I went on like, I basically went on almost like an audition a day for like a few, I went on like a hundred auditions in three months. Again, a lot of these for super sketchy, like I'm in some dude's basement and I'm like, not sure that I'm safe. <laughs> Something they were like, ah, probably you're not going to, not going to work on this project. Going to turn this one down if they say they want to work together. Um, and some, you know, USC undergrad filling, good stuff. And I, I had a good callback rate and I booked a couple dozen, I think probably yeah, about 30% of the stuff I went out on. Again, some of these things I hope never any human will ever watch. But I was like, okay, like I'm at least in the running. Like I, I'm good enough. It's not to a begin. fluke, you know. Yeah, it's not a fluke. I'm getting, you know, my acting must be at, a, at least a good enough level that I'm booking these level of things. And then, and then, I mean, it's a moving target, right? Because then at a certain point I go, okay, I'm not going to do unpaid work anymore. And I'm not going to do non-union work anymore. I've been on enough sets where if you can't fill out the union paperwork, I am pretty confident that you're not going to have food for me and the footage is going to be completely unusable. And so I'm not going to do any more non-union projects. And then it was, it was just before my third year in LA when I booked my first TV coaster. I, I booked a, a co-star on CSI Miami. And my experience is that you know, that's a, frankly, a fairly fast timeline. Most people I know, it takes them more than three years to book their first legit TV credit, which I think is, it's important for us to put into context because there's this idea that, oh, everybody's booking everything and I'm not, and they're doing it so much faster than I am. And I'm not a big fan of being realist. I don't like the word realistic, but I want it to be in touch with reality. It is not in touch with reality to believe that you're going to come out and book a series regular within your first year. Some people do. Some people win the lottery. Yeah. And if you're super young and super attractive, you can kind of skip some lines. But for every one person who gets that opportunity and actually does book that thing, 10,000 of them didn't. So it was, it was about three, right before three years in LA that I booked my first TV co-star. And then, and then I think it was a couple of years before I booked my next one, honestly. And I was doing other stuff in between then and other films and felt like I was making progress. But the but the big thing that I realized was when I stopped measuring my progress and success by what I booked and started measuring it by the quantity and quality of relationships that I was making, everything changed. Because for whatever reason, actors get this thing that like the only way that it means I'm succeeding in acting is if I book a job on TV or if I get an agent. Right. And for whatever reason, we've decided that's the only thing that means you're succeeding. And that's bullshit. And those things don't happen very often, even if you're crushing it in your career. So it just sets us up to fail. And anyone that has done either of those things, you know, once you get an agent, things are not, you know, you don't coast. That doesn't mean exactly. <laughs> I'm done now. Nope. And if you get like a co-star or even a recurring, it's like, okay, that's nice, but that ain't going to pay the bills for the rest of your life. No. And, and that's what's so important. And I like, 
you know, I talk about that now. If someone, if you book five guest stars on television in a year, you are crushing it. You are creating a career on television. You are doing everything right. You have the ability to achieve all of your dreams. A top of show guest star on a network show is going to pay you maybe like $10,000. So if I book five of those in a year, that means I made $50,000 minus 10% to my agent, 10 or 15% to my manager, taxes, a small amount to union dues. And, and so now I'm, now I'm like what at $35,000 and my headshots cost about $1,000 and I've spent two or $3,000 that year on classes and another few thousand, you know, going to networking events and another, you know, thousand on marketing materials and on and on and on. And all of a sudden I've, I've, I have zero profit <laughs> or generally I've actually spent more than that amount to get to that place. Right. And that's okay. That's the thing. That's where it's tough is it's like, oh my God, I must not be making it. It's like, no, 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 you're crushing it. That's just what happens in business. Amazon didn't make a profit for seven years. Twitter still hasn't made a profit. And frankly, they may end up going out of business, but that's just how business works. Well, and, and, and that brings up an interesting point, which kind of leads me into something else I want to talk about is things don't pay what they used to, you know, there, and, mm-hmm. and there, very rarely do you have someone who can come out and be an actor. All they got to do is show up and be on camera and like their life is set. I mean, you know, you have these kind of actorpreneurs where it's like you're doing multiple things yep. out of necessity because, you know, these, these co-stars or, you know, guest stars, they don't pay what they used to. What I was, yep. what I wanted to kind of get into was I wanted to kind of discuss your involvement with the union, like where you just, cause it's related a little bit, you know, yeah, like what totally. you make as an actor uh, and the conditions you work under certainly. But I am curious, like where that started. Well, it started, uh, Woody Schultz, who you may know. Yes. Um, yeah. Talked to me about it one time. He's like, Hey, I want to get you more involved with SAG after and some of the things I'm up to. And it was right. It was before I had joined. I was like, Oh yeah, I'm definitely interested in that. I, I'm not a member just yet. And then, and then I actually, I was, I was a must join and I was a member of AFTRA when the unions merged uh, a little over five years ago. And so that was when I became a, a full-fledged member um, and, and I knew Woody. And so then they got me involved. Initially, I ended up coming in and I, and I became the chair of the Next Gen Performers Committee, which I'm still the chair of. And so that was sort of the genesis. It was like a, so it was what a, is that? It was a what new it, what, committee okay. that is it, – it started with a number of people who – you know Woody and others who were involved in – sag after and realized that there wasn't a committee or anything specifically designed for the younger demographic of union members. And they were like, we want something that creates a new way of communicating with people that taps into the way of social media and all these other things that, that young people are doing. So what really what it is, is that it's the, the cutting edge community for the future of the entertainment industry. It's a, it's a place for people to connect, learn, get involved we do mixers and events. We brought Rick and Laura, uh, Laura Hall, who's the musician from Whose Line Is It Anyway, just did a, a came back and did a song prov event. We have stuff on social media. Um, links are all at nextgenperformers.com. It'll take you to our SAG After page. But we're on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, and we're putting out resources and continuing to, with all of us in the committee, find ways to support and engage the membership because there, I found that there was a gap between the amazing things that sag was and is doing and people's knowledge of them. And I was like, I want to do something to close that gap and connect people with, oh my God, the union is actually doing all these amazing things. And I, I had no idea. We, we must do a better job of communicating that and engaging our members. So that's where I got involved. And, and I ended up, I'm on the local board. I've been on the local board for a few years now. And, and I'm on, I don't know, probably a dozen other committees uh, with, with sag But what I... What I will say to where, where this conversation started with rates and the money we make, I find that sometimes people get mad at the union and say, man, it's just not what it used to be. You can't make the money you used to. Damn you, sag And the truth is what, what happened was the entertainment industry changed the same way that the music industry changed and is changing the same way that the book publishing company changed. The industry completely transformed and is still in the process of doing that. So it's not like the union stopped doing things for members or stop. It's like, no, no, there are now 455 scripted television shows this year on television. 
that is a very, very, very different economic backdrop than 30 years ago when you had three networks right. or four networks. And though, so of course, so 30 million people are watching a show because those, there's only two or three options. So now, you know, if look, if 15 million people are watching a show, advertisers will spend more money because there's 15 million people watching it. Now we have all kind. Now we have 450 shows. So there's just by the by the economic backdrop of it, there are fewer people watching any given show, and therefore advertisers spend less money for their ads or for their people on that one given show. So the benefit is there's more content than ever. There are more jobs for actors than ever. And, and in my opinion, there, there are better jobs for actors than ever. I mean, it, you know, talk about the heyday of television and incredible content that we can do these amazing things. But the flip side of that is just from an economic standpoint, there's less money in any one given job. Sure. So, no, it, it, and it's, it's helpful to remember, like, just how much is going on. And, and I don't think people are deaf to that. I mean, like, you, you see Netflix and Hulu and YouTube, and everybody's yeah. coming out with their own original programming, too. And then you add in all of the unscripted shows that have been yep. taking a market share, uh, you know, from what would have been scripted television. Yeah, and it's happening so fast. I mean, three years ago, Netflix had one original show. Yeah. Three years ago. Now they're spending billions on original content. Right. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's pretty insane. amazing. So do you find within the union, because you're also going to the, or you're part of the national convention, is that what it's called? It is a every two year convention that, that was, when, they, when the unions merged, this, the, the convention was something that was, um, I believe it was after that had conventions. I don't believe that Legacy SAG did, but so it was one of the, you know, we, we sort of merged those ideas. And so there's a convention that happens every two years. And I was elected as one of the LA delegates. And we do things like elect some of the national officers. And then there's a number of resolutions. And do you feel like things actually get done? Uh, you know, or does it feel overly political at times? Uh, you know, you don't need to name names here, but I'm just kind of curious, like, how functional of a of a body does it feel like, yeah, we're actually making progress uh, of course, things, you know, can move, you know, take more time than you want. But, you know, you, you do feel like things are going in the right direction. The short version is that I, I've actually been remarkably impressed with the overall trajectory and and effectiveness of SAG-AFTRA as a, as a union. If you look at what's happening in the rest of the country and the union, like, our members are better protected. They get better pay. They're less. Ex they're, they're not exploited. They have protections in ways that almost no workers in the country have. It's it is remarkable, and it's easy to forget that. And I think to take it for granted because it's like, well, yeah, that's just how it is. It's not just how it is. It is because SAG-AFTRA has been around and has worked really hard over many many decades to make sure that we're protected and that we get paid a fair wage and that we can have. I, there's nowhere – I don't know a single other place in the country, in the economy, where you can make $17,000 in a year and have premium top-shelf health insurance. Like that just doesn't sure. – where else can you do that? And I'm not yeah. saying I get that it's difficult to make that much money as, a, as, a, as an actor. I get right. it. Right, of course. But where else in the country could, could you actually still get amazing health insurance for making that money? So overall i'm absolutely impressed we have we have relatively a tiny tiny staff as as a union i mean it is a skeletal staff and and because you know we want to keep dues as low as possible but what they what they're able to create for members in our contracts and our protections i mean that's a lot of the stuff that happens that we don't see right contract negotiations and lawyers and people who are going after shows that are exploiting people and not protecting people on set and that sort of thing so Overall, I'm very impressed. Now, the flip side of that is it is a large organization. And with any large organization, particularly with a political element, it is a bureaucracy. And it tends to be more like moving a cruise ship than a speedboat. And the same is true of a large business, right? When I had a startup and it was just a couple of us, we could do things we want in action and we could change something tomorrow. Whereas if you're, if you're managing Apple and you have 100,000 employees, the trajectory of change is a lot slower because to move something that large for good reason takes a long time or longer than I personally would prefer. 
So there are times where I'm absolutely frustrated because things take longer than I prefer. I've, I've worked, again, I worked for Congress, so I, I've seen slow moving lack of change. Uh, and I, and I'm very, I'm, I'm particularly well acquainted with what it is to be in a larger bureaucratic organization. So I think I personally have a little more patience for it in ways that it's frustrating. And you come in, you're like, why can't we just do these things? And it is frustrating. And sometimes there isn't good reason for it. And oftentimes there are. And the more that I get involved in that, I'm like, oh, that's why we do it that way. It does seem stupid. But now that I know why, oh, I get it. You know, like a, like a, an easy example is how come they're mailing me a residual check for three cents, the stamp costs 30 some cents. That's the dumbest thing ever. Why is that? The union is stupid. And then I start to learn, I go, oh, well, because federal law says that the union legally cannot hold on to money. So they have to immediately get you the money because they can't hold on to it because it's against federal law. And the, frankly, the studios stonewalled getting direct deposit set up for so long. Now it's actually happening. It's in progress. And, and now people will be able to have direct deposit and we will have solved that problem. But it was like, oh, that wasn't a SAG after thing. We've been wanting to do that and working on getting that for a long time. There were federal laws that prohibited it. And the studios were being jackasses, uh, in my opinion, on that issue about not getting direct deposit set up. And we found a way to do it. And now it's happening. So do you do you see a uh, a long term future for yourself in the union work? Is this something that you definitely want to continue and like get into you know get into those national boardroom uh, conversations and and you know really kind of steering the direction of the uh, union or do you enjoy the level of change where you're at now? Yes. Um, so I because I've been a local board member, one of the ways that the national board works is that if somebody's not available. If a, if a national board member is not available to be at a national board meeting, and that happens because it's working actors, it's like, oh yeah, I'm, he's out filming This Is Us, and she's off, you know, in New York filming something. So oftentimes there will be a you know national board member who can't make it, and for the national board, you can fill in an alternate. So I've been able to fill in as an alternate, and so I've been at I think every national board meeting for almost the last couple of years. So I have been able to really be in that room and to be at at relatively high levels of of that conversation of what we're doing as a union and where we're going and, and those other pieces. And I, I do want to continue to be involved in whatever way I can, I can make the most difference. The political side and being a board member is, is one piece of it. Frankly, to me, the, the most change actually happens at the committee level, mm. what I'm doing with next gen performers and, and the videos we're doing and, and other way, you know, pot working on a podcast and, and media and reaching members and, and events for members. And, you know, to me, that's where it really makes the difference the longer term piece of it is like, yeah, what is our strategy as a union and what are we doing around low budget new media and how are we overall getting the best contracts? And I, I, I care about that because I, I want to be sure that 10 years from now I can have health insurance and enough money to support my future family doing the thing that I love. So even from a selfish standpoint, like I need this to be around because this is my career. So I right. want it to be here. Um, but yeah, my, my intention is to continue to be involved at, at high levels as, as much as I can be, because I, I think unions are important. And frankly, it's almost astonishing to me that we've seen anti-union rhetoric out there. And, and it is appalling to me that, that the Republicans who claim to be the party of the working class are anti-union and then go and the current tax cut that is out there, I think it's 80 or 90% of the savings over the next seven years of that tax plan would go to the top 1%. That is insane. It is working people in America ought to be outraged. That is insane. And unions overwhelmingly are able to protect workers. It gives us the ability to go up against multi-billion dollar corporations who are able to hire the best lawyers and the best things and get themselves the best deals and have the best lobbyists in Washington to get all of the best deals for themselves. And it actually allows us to come together and say, hey, no, you know what? If you want to work with the best actors who are making your companies billions of dollars to work with this 160,000 group of the best performers on the planet, you have to negotiate fair wages and you have to be safe on set and you have to have, you know, protections for the stunt people. And you have to make sure that we can actually have health insurance so that we can be protected. And it allows, and, and I think, we then get to work together. We're all in it together. I'm not, I'm not against the studios. I, I'm, thankfully, they exist right. and they're making TV shows that I can be in. Great. So now we can all work together 
in a way where we're all protected. And because of that, the, the economics of the entertainment industry have actually remained remarkably vibrant over decades and decades where other industries have not. And I think partly it's because it's one of the most unionized. The writers have a union and the, and the, you know, the, the director's guild and all these other pieces. I think that's partly why the entertainment industry succeeds because everybody's coming to the table to make sure that we're creating as many win-wins as possible so that everybody succeeds together. And lo and behold, surprise, it's working. And the entertainment industry relatively is thriving in the economy and continues to do so. Cool. Yeah, I mean, it's it's exciting to hear an insider's perspective, you know, on the union. Um, I would love to do some kind of more rapid fire questions. So these are more designed to kind of give people some more shorter, shorter ideas, more eh, maybe sometimes actionable, but you'll see, you'll see where we get. So what, uh, first one, uh, and by the way, before I, before I go any further, it's been a great conversation. So I've really enjoyed, uh, learning more about you and, and hearing, you know, your process and hearing what you do to, you know, move yourself further. So it's, uh, well, I really, really appreciate that. It's been, it's been a joy for me. I, I, since I've met you, I feel like you ask very, very, interesting and unique and, and useful questions, both for me that I enjoy answering, but that I hope is useful to other people and things that like, wow, I'm so glad you asked that. That's such a, that is a way to think about it. That I think is really important or so. So I really appreciate the time and effort that you put into you bringing your skills to bear and, and asking amazing questions. Well, curiosity is a funny thing because, you know, you can, you can feel like, oh yeah, this would be interesting, but you know, and then you get like anything, you can overthink it. Like, would anyone else care? And it's just like, well, I don't know. I'm sure. curious about this random thing. So I'm going to ask about it. I'm going to ask it. All right. So first one is what are one to three books that have greatly influenced your life? Crush It by Gary Vaynerchuk. Mm -hmm. It's what I made people read in my, in my class at UCLA with, with my buddy AJ. Never Eat Alone by Keith Ferrazzi, I think is the best book on relationships on the planet. I Will Teach You to Be Rich by Ramit Sethi is the most actionable and best book on personal finance that exists. I'm a huge fan of Brene Brown. The Gifts of Imperfection is a great place to start with her. Okay, cool. That's good. I, I could, I, I have I could a tell huge you could go list, on. Yeah. <laughs> but those are, those are like the top ones that I would have people start with. Okay, cool. So how has a failure or apparent failure set you up later for success? Uh, do you have like a favorite failure? Something that maybe at the time you were like, oh man, this just did not go well. And, or this like, I really sucked up the room on this, but you realize how <laughs> like it, it actually paid off later. Yeah, I got I to think of all the women I've asked out. Um, <laughs> I, the one that stands out for me is so that, so the company I co-founded in college, tuition specialist, we were helping out of state students get in state tuition and we, and we ended up saving kids like $30 million. It was an amazing thing. Long story short, the university we we're primarily working with, they, they decided to change how they interpret the state laws and, and essentially overnight our company went out of business. It's a little more nuanced than that, but that's basically what happened. And, and it felt devastating. It was like this amazing thing that we'd spent years building. I'm so proud of what we created. We had this incredible company with incredible company culture. We were making money. We we're say, you know, we're doing a social good, like this remarkable success that I'm so proud of. And then sort of overnight it was just gone. Hmm. And and the trajectory that I had been on of like, oh man, like I might be able to retire in my 30s. Poof. It was just still, okay, that's not what's gonna happen anymore. And so it felt devastating. Ultimately, what happened was it allowed me to then, because, because of some of the money we still had and we're making, it allowed me to spend the next year focused basically 100% on acting. And it's what really allowed, but I had said, I'm going to transition out of this company so I can focus more on acting. And I was in the process, literally my last day was the day before we got the news and like the night before. And then it was like, okay, the universe is helping me move more rapidly in that transition. And so it really is what allowed me to then catapult my acting career to the next level. Cool. What is one of the best or most worthwhile investments you've ever made? Could be an investment of money, time, energy, etc. The investments that I've made in my own personal and emotional development have all been the ones that have made the biggest difference. Primarily for me, I, I did this leadership program out here in LA called MITT, Mastery and Transformational Training. And in terms of the amount of life-changing things that happened per dollar, it is, I, I might as well have won the lottery. Hmm. Very cool. Uh, yeah. I mean, I know you've, uh, you've been involved in that 
for a number of years, like different levels of programs with them. So yeah, you know, I went through their cool. curriculum and I've gone back to volunteer and coach and my whole family's gone through it. And, and it ultimately, like I, I didn't talk to my mom for six years when sort of things all went to crap and, and it was, uh, you know, my experience was sort of too toxic for me to be involved. But then through the leadership program, it just provided a context for me to deal with all of the things that had been a challenge growing up and, and the trauma and all these other pieces and allowed me to create a safe space for myself. And it allowed me to reach back out and connect with my mother mm-hmm. and start a relationship with my sister, who's now my best friend. We're going to the Macklemore concert. I'm stoked about it. And like my sister's like my best friend. We talk all the time. Like I adore her. And I didn't have a relationship with her until we did this. Like if you met us now, you'd be like, wait a second, you guys like didn't have a relationship before because she's I'm maybe closer to her than anyone else. So, and I start, so I had reached out to my mom and I was able to connect with her for the last couple of years before she passed away. And, you know, those kinds of completely mm-hmm. life-changing experiences because I took a, you know, dinky little leadership class right. and completely mm-hmm. transformed my life. Well, it kind of dovetails in, in, into this next question. What is one personal and one professional accomplishment that you're most proud of? The person, the thing I'm most proud of as a, as a human is, is the relationship I've created with my family and the context of I have I'm I'm looking up ab- above my desk I've got uh, all these lovely pictures of of my family and my siblings and my dad and you know we hear it all the time it's like what are you going to care about on your deathbed if I were to die today I wouldn't have regrets and I would be grateful for the relationships that I've created with my family and that we've made a difference with each other and we've healed past wounds and we've created a new context for what's possible for families in a way that's so powerful that I have other people say like, wow, your family's the model of how I want my family to be. I see a new possibility for what family, and, and that wasn't something growing, like that was not what I thought would be the difference that I might make. It really wasn't. And that's just, in a way it just sort of happened, but that's what I'm most proud of personally. Um, professionally, I mean, the fact that I can even have health insurance, like to be any level of a working actor is really cool to get paid a working wage to do the thing that I love is so cool. Honestly, what I think I'm most proud of though, like where I, I go, yeah, when, is when I see the difference that it makes for other people. And, you know, I, I also do coaching on the side. And when I see, you know, this, just this week, I had a couple of my clients who booked their first TV roles. And I'm like, with, as a direct result of coaching that they got from me and what, you know, what we created together for them, and that makes me so happy because I'm like, yeah, I want there to be more artists and I, I want more people to be thriving and living the life that they want to be living. So when I see that happening, uh, uh, it's just, it's such a treat. Yeah, it is. Uh, it is pretty amazing. Um, you do a great job of setting up all these questions, actually, <laughs> giving a little connective I'm psychic. glue. Are there any bad recommendations you hear in the acting profession or in show business? People are like, oh, you should totally do this or you need to do that. And you're like, don't ever, ever, ever do that. (laughs) Yes, plenty. The number one thing that started was, especially when I was in college, people kept saying, look, if you you can see yourself doing anything else but acting, it's not for you. Don't pursue it. If you – when I was like in college, I was majoring in theater, but I was also majoring in political science and a minor in leadership and doing all these clubs. And, and there were certain people who were like, well, then you know what? You probably aren't designed to be an actor because you clearly love other stuff as well. No, I'm one of the few people who is still an actor because I had other things that have allowed me to pay the bills while I've built up a career. And yeah, I totally have other passions. You don't think Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt and Meryl Streep have other passions and other things they're spending their time on in addition to acting? Of course they are. So to me, that is like a foundational piece of advice that I think is total bullshit. Um, I think it's important to know the rules of the game so that you can break them intelligently. So there are times when, like, look, you know, casting directors will say, yeah, you know what, look, don't send us postcards, don't do drop-offs, don't pitch yourself. And it's important for us to remember the context that they're sharing that from. Because if every actor in LA did that, they literally wouldn't be able to do their jobs. But... On that rare occasion, or not so rare occasion, where there's a role that you're perfect for, that you're solving their problem and you're at the level that it makes sense to reach out and go do a drop off and call the thing and pitch yourself and go outside of the bounds. Don't don't do something stupid. Right. Don't it's stalk them and steal their cat. It's doing it in a professional way. The the, the, the Kevinism from the Actors Network of always be leaving. You know, it's exactly. like Exactly. <laughs> 
right? But so to do that, of course, is fine and acceptable to start to push some of those bounds and we can sort of lock ourselves into, well, no, this is the way to do it. And it's sure. partly why some people have a bunch of success at the beginning because they don't know any better. So they do stuff that's like, oh, wow, that got them in front of someone and got someone to pay attention in a way that's creative. Yeah, you don't know the rules, so you don't know what's allowed and what's not. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I, I don't know. I just called them and they gave me an audition. It's like, yeah, that is a thing you can do. So, all right. Um, I think this will be, I mean, we, we go on and on, but I'll make this the final question. When you feel overwhelmed or unfocused or you've lost your focus temporarily, what do you do? What's your, what's your process to get yourself back on track? I have created systems and habits that make sure that I won't stay in that place for too long. So I have a daily accountability buddy who I send a text message to by 10 a.m. every day. We, we send it to each other. What's the number one most important thing to accomplish today? And a couple other things, what, you know, what else is scheduled and, and that sort of thing. But I have that. My, uh, one of my best friends from high school who's out here in L.A. who we've stayed dear friends, uh, Robin, he and I do a extensive annual review every year. We drive back to Colorado to see our family and we spend the you know 20 hour drive there and the 20 hour drive back doing a huge review of the last year and what worked and what didn't in every domain of our life from health and career and finances and then plan out the coming year. And then we check in every quarter around that. So you know I have these things in my life because it, it I can get off track and I do get overwhelmed. And there are things that are like, wow, you know what, what I'm doing right now just isn't working. But so I have these things built in, which I think is important for any kind of entrepreneurial endeavor, whether, you know, especially if you're in a creative career, because you don't have an annual check-in with your boss. No one's going to fire you because you didn't go to work this week as an actor. You're just not going to have the success you want. So creating for ourselves some accountability and systems that force us to check in on some kind of regular basis so that we don't get off track like it would be impossible for me to go three years down a really bad track because my friends would stop me from doing it. You know, they'd whip me into shape. So in the short term, I do my best to keep my body healthy and exercise. You know, hot yoga is a thing for me that really reconnects me to grateful and connected space as a human for me. I love hot yoga. It's t type A yoga. Um, I love it. And in the moment, coming back to the perspective of like, what's the, what's the main thing I'm working on right now? Or let me come back to gratitude in this moment of, yeah, you know what? Even if, I'm not, even if I don't have the money in the bank account right now that I want, I'm alive and I live in an, an apartment and in a city and I'm surrounded by amazing people. So even on my worst day, I'm doing just fine. Well, what I love about your answer, and uh, you know, this is very consistent throughout our conversation today, is that it, it does seem a lot to come back to relationships. You know, it, whether it's your personal success, your professional success, you know, and, and just in all different forms, it, it, it seems like that is definitely something that is very strong with you, young one. So um, cool. Well, Thank uh, you. Yeah, Ben, this has been uh, a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. It's been maybe my favorite conversation like this I've had. I really. I I really appreciate you and I'm I'm so glad to have have met you going on a decade ago and it's so fun to see all the different things you know you're always creating and doing things to add value to whatever community you're in and listening you know you do such a fantastic job of listening both to what's going on in the world and to the people in your life and and it's really uh, really a treat. Well thanks man I really appreciate it. This has been awesome. <laughs> It's Nathan here one more time. If you enjoyed this episode, please remember to subscribe to the show so you don't miss anything. And if you can take a minute to rate and review this in iTunes or wherever you find podcasts, that will help others find out about the show. I appreciate all comments and thank you very much for doing that. Be sure to visit workingactorsjourney.com slash podcast for the show notes and any links from today's episode. You can also follow the show on Twitter and Instagram. Feel free to connect and let us know what did you enjoy from the show. Don't forget to visit workingactorsjourney.com slash audible for your free audiobook and 30-day trial from Audible. Thank you again to today's guest. I really appreciate and value all the people that contribute their time to making this show possible. I'm Nathan Agan, and thanks for listening.